yeah, let's go on with our second speaker. So I'm glad that I have the chance to introduce Professor Dirk Lewandowski. But first, I would like to read one sentence of the abstract of him. Search engines like Google have a massive influence on what information users get to see and on what search results users select. And if we remember from the talk before, the, the results of, for example, using Google forms our knowledge. And sometimes we are asking ourselves, why did I see this or why didn't I see maybe other results? And I guess this connection between the talk before and the one sentence I already read shows how important it is to realize that a search engine have a lot of benefits, but that there is more behind than only to see, oh, wow, I have 10, um, uh, 10 yes, results, but maybe it's not everything and maybe it's not the point I would like to know. So there is only one thing to say, let's have a call for fair search engine. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, I would say, um, uh, giving, uh, putting this talk into relation with Olaf's talk, uh, if you don't get anything from my talk and you, or you find it very uninteresting, at least one thing you will uh, definitely get, which is the different traditions in information science research, the different perspectives Olaf mentioned, you will see that uh, my talk is definitely from the um, information uh, retrieval perspective. The name of the talk, as already was mentioned, is uh, a call for fair search engines. And um, the topic I'm interested is, uh, in is um, what are actually the calls for fair, fair search engines? There are different approaches uh, from different fields also um, on how we could uh, provide users with uh, fair access to information through search engines. So um, I will give a brief introduction uh, on the focus I'm taking here, which is uh, search engine results pages. And the questions that were, that were already raised, how do users perceive the results pages? Where uh, goes their attention to? And actually, what results do they select? Then I'll be talking a bit about uh, search engine bias, and I will give you some examples of uh, biases that may be problematic, and um, also some examples of biases well, um, that may be there, but um, that you maybe uh, do not recognize at all. And uh, in the third part, I will focus on uh, the approaches of making search fair, or I should say, making search at least fairer than it is today. So, um, as I said, I will be focusing on uh, the search engine results pages, and um, I would say before they actually disappear uh, into voice assistants, or we can already see the trend of uh, search results pages disappearing on the mobile phone because you only have very small uh, screens and therefore very small uh, search results pages. So let's have a look at some examples of uh, typical search results pages. Don't worry if you can't read anything. Uh, uh, it is only, um, well, um, the different types of um, results I'm interested in here. On the left-hand side, you see the typical search results page, which consists basically of two lists. And um, the two lists are uh, first the list of advertisements, and then the list of so-called organic results, which are the neutral results gener generated by uh, the relevance ranking algorithm. In the middle, you see uh, a search results page, which contains additional results uh, from uh, specialized collections like uh, the video results, um, which you can see injected into the list of organic results. On, and on the right-hand side, you can see um, results from Google's shopping search engine. I will, I will come back to uh, Google's shopping uh, case, which was uh, uh, 
first um, investigation by the European Commission against Google uh, later on in this term. On the right-hand side, uh, you see um, a search results page that not only contains uh, the so-called universal results, which are um, the news results on top, but also on the right-hand side, a collection of factual information that's put together by Google from sources like Wikipedia and um, from their own uh, search queries or collected uh, search queries. So what we can see is that um, moving from the left to the right, the search results page has changed over the uh, last years. And also uh, the big trend that we don't only get documents, but we get ready-made uh, answers. Which means, um, in, in the case on, on the right-hand side, you see basic factual information about Angela Merkel. So if you are interested in when she was born, you can just um, grab her birth date and uh, that's it. So you don't have to click on any results. And uh, what is not uh, depicted here is um, that you oftentimes now in Google get uh, direct answers which are extracted from documents. I will show you uh, an infamous example uh, in a few minutes. So uh, the question is, what makes a user click on uh, a certain search result? And um, there are many influences. And before we look at where users um, actually click, we have to look at uh, what uh, really gets their attention. So we have ways of measuring visual attention, which is mainly through eye tracking. So um, here is a rather old example, or two rather old examples uh, from an eye tracking study we did. Um, this is uh, not a surprise at all. This is uh, the result of basically every eye tracking study you can find. On the left hand side, you see uh, a single list of results and you see uh, the typical visual attention, which is users predominantly focus on the first results and they spend more time reading the first results. So you have um, like a, it's called the golden triangle, um, how users inspect the search results. This basically holds true for every list-based presentation, whether it be search result or results or something else. The question, though, is when you change the results of presentation, user's visual uh, attention also changes, which you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, universal search results injected into the results page. In this case, it is uh, news results at the top, then the image results, and at the bottom you have the video results. And in these cases, you can spot general patterns, like in the first one, but also it very much, much depends uh, on the individual user, um, it depends on the task and so on. Everything Olaf mentioned um, is, you can see, in, uh, um, in when, you, in, when you have tasks like, tasks like these. So, what actually influences uh, the user selecting the results or um, uh, first, um, well, seeing the results? It's the results position, obviously. Nobody reads uh, more than a couple of results uh, before selecting one. Then uh, it is very important uh, to have the result in the uh, so-called uh, visible area or the area above the fold, which basically means you have to see the result uh, without scrolling down on the results list. And um, this may not be too much of a problem when we think about desktop search, but think of your searches on the mobile phone, you will not have uh, many results um, to be seen without scrolling down. Then, of course, um, we have um, an influence of the uh, perceived uh, relevance of the results description. So the snippet that you actually see representing the result, so you make a judgment that is basically this result seems to be interesting, uh, after that you don't actually know whether it actually is. And then um, we have uh, something uh, which is uh, called attraction bias, which uh, basically mean, means that the uh, size and the design of the snippets influence user's behavior. So if you, for instance, have a uh, result that has an additional image, like uh, most of the results um, shown in Google or YouTube. Um, this attracts users' uh, interest, so um, uh, even if you have a result that is uh, positioned on top of that result, it may not get uh, that much 
much attention or by much, click, much clicks as the result of the cause of recommendation. This all may not be too problematic if not users are trusted that much in, to, in search engines. So um, one of the studies Olaf already mentioned, uh, the uh, Search Engine Boost 2000, 2012 study, uh, found out that uh, results are usually seen as accurate and trustworthy by the users. So there's no doubting in the quality and trustworthiness of the results. And even search engine results ranking is seen as a criterion for, criterion for trustworthiness, which means users tell you this result must be trustworthy because Google put it on top. This is the reason for it being trustworthy and then you can see that it forms a cycle. So, um, apart from uh, the more structural analysis of the search results pages, it is also interesting to see what actually turns up. Where do the results come from? And um, there are some studies investigating domains or sources of results in the, in the top results. Um, I think the, I would say best because it's uh, the largest database. The best study uh, in this sense is a study uh, from Yahoo Research. They researched 2.6 billion search keywords. And um, they found out that about 80% of all clicks in the search results go to a mere 10,000 websites. So while we still have all the variety of the internet represented in the search engines, what users actually click on maybe because of the presentation of the results ranking, is a rather small subset in many cases. Still, we are able to access all the other content, but we are guided towards uh, very popular sites. Then there's an uh, older study from Amanda Spink and colleagues uh, that found that there is a rather low overlap between uh, top 10 results from different search engines. I think this would be a topic worthwhile researching um, again because uh, the, the landscape in search uh, changed a lot. And um, also in an older study, a colleague of me uh, found out uh, that um, the most popular sources uh, within the top 10 results of different search engines at the time in 2009 differed quite a lot and that search engine providers preferred their own offerings. So for instance, um, at that time, um, uh, Microsoft had a shopping comparison uh, service um, and they um, preferred the results from that in their results while Google preferred results from YouTube and so on. So you can see a certain, um, a certain pattern here. And in a recent study I did with a colleague, uh, which is rather a case study, um, just a, well, uh, a first try, to first try uh, the approach out. Um, we asked whether um, actually it's worth uh, investigating not uh, websites or domain, but instead providers. So um, the idea was that some providers might have uh, different websites for the same topic, and we tried it for uh, insurance comparisons. And we ex extracted the impress datas, data from uh, the websites and compared them, so um, we were able to find out, and it was um, um, actually the case, that some providers operate uh, more than one website uh, in terms of having their sites uh, shown up in Google results more often. So um, after this introduction about um, the search engine results pages, I'd like to talk a bit about search engine bias. And please forgive me that the definition I give for search engine bias is actually my own. Uh, what I wrote in an article in uh, 2017 is uh, search engine bias is the tendency of the search engine to prefer certain results through the assumptions inherent in its algorithms. This is a very general definition, I agree. And um, in an uh, encyclopedia entry in 2012, uh, Herman Tavani uh, divided the problems we usually discuss when we discuss search engine bias into three um, concerns. I'll read them out for you. The first one is, search engine technology is not neutral, but instead has embedded features in its design to favor some values over others. Secondly, major search engines systematically favor sites 
at the kinds of sites over others and list of results they return in response to user search queries. And thirdly, search algorithms do not use objective criteria in generating the lists of results for search queries. So you can divide uh, the problem into two different uh, sections. But what I argue in this talk is um, that it doesn't bring us too far because um, the discussion on search engine bias usually is limited to the organic results. And as I showed you, uh, the results, uh, search results pages are very complex. And uh, looking at it from, from the user perspective, search results pages can be quite confusing. So um, the other side, uh, or the other perspective on that is what Google said in uh, 2016. They said, search is a reflection of the content that exists on the web. And this relates uh, to a question we posed earlier about um, whether the autocomplete function is only a reflection of what users are actually searching for. It is not. It is more than that. It is heavily filtered. Um, we don't know, is it the all-time favorite um, searches from users? Is it the uh, most favorite searches uh, from users from the last week or whatever it is? Uh, nobody knows. Um, what we know is that Google uh, now prefers to speak of uh, its predictions, not suggestions. They're trying to predict what you are really searching for. They don't give su suggestions because they had so many uh, bad suggestions um, that they gave up uh, calling them suggestions. So, uh, again, they say search is a reflection of the content that exists on the web. The fact that hate sites appear in search results in no way means that Google endorses these views. While this is certainly a good position, uh, this statement was a reaction to this case. This was uh, Google in the US. Um, the question uh, began with the words, did the, Hol did the Holocaust happen? And the first result is a result from Stormfront.org, a organ neo-Nazi organization uh, which is uh, forbidden in Germany at least, and I think in may many uh, European countries. Uh, in the US it turned up as the first result according to Google. So, this may be a, an obvious case of fractions of relevance of, um, of search engine bias. Let's look at another example. This one. One of my favorite queries. It works in German, it works in English, it works, I think, in every language. Female athletes. And this is what you get for uh, the query female athletes. Uh, you get results like um, the first one, the 30 hottest females at who dominate the sport, or the second one, the 50 hottest female athletes of 2018. So um, if you scroll down the list, at a certain point, you will find different uh, views on female athletes. But the dominant interpretation is that female athletes are sexy and here uh, go to the side and look at the pictures. The question is, is that really a reflection of the content that is on the web. I would argue it is in some way, but it is not the only possible reflection of the content that is there. Because when you go down to, say, result 100, you get quite different results. And you can easily try it out. Just use Google's image search and type in female athletes. You will see all the bikini pictures uh, until result 100, 150, and then it changes. And this, although, uh, although uh, search engines are changing all the time, this is a very stable result. So um, I'm using this example. I've been using it for, for five years now, I think. Uh, it always works. If you don't like it. <laughs> so uh, we had two examples. One was very, very obvious, that this is uh, the first result is the result we as a society, I hope we agree, we don't like. The second one, I think we can have uh, a big discussion about it, whether it just represents what users want on the web, um, what content is put on the web. But as I said, there are other, uh, there's other content um, that you can also see for the 
these types of queries. Let's consider a third example. My other favorite query, as all my students know, uh, granular synthesis. Nobody knows what it is. That's great uh, uh, because um, you can show a lot of things um, with this uh, query. First of all, no universal search results, just a simple list um, of results. And no surprise here, Wikipedia is the first result. But when you look at the other results, and I hope you can read a bit uh, uh, of it, are these good results? You say, no, they're not. Actually, I don't know. I have no clue about granular synthesis. So we often search for topics where we don't have any idea uh, what it is about. So we actually don't know um, whether these results are any good, whether they um, um, provide different perspectives or uh, whatever. So it may be even more problematic when we have these cases where um, we actually uh, can't really judge the quality of the results than in the cases where we can at least uh, get an idea that there may be other things um, on the topic or where we can see that obviously something is wrong with these results. So um, talking about biases in uh, search results, um, there has been a lot of uh, empirical research um, on it um, with some problems. But um, it was found that there are uh, biases in regards to race, to gender, uh, that you get um, confirming information for queries when you query for uh, conspiracy theories. So if you put in something like uh, chemtrails or did the moon landing happen, uh, you have a certain probability that the results uh, will be confirmative. Then um, there are um, many cases documented where search engines promote uh, through this uh, ranking of search results uh, hate speech. And uh, there's a famous study from uh, 2009 where um, uh, researchers uh, found out that when you search for um, health topics, like um, you type in into the search engine, you have a headache, you have a very high probability and a much higher probability than when you use um, professional sites from, from medical clinics or um, um, other uh, information sources. So in search engines, you have a high probability that they um, show you results and say, the reason for your headache might be a brain tumor. So it's a very short way from um, rather harmless symptoms to um, severe uh, medical uh, uh, analysis. So the problem with uh, empirical uh, stu studies on uh, search engine bias is usually that um, it is oftentimes case studies. So uh, researchers pick uh, certain queries and um, I wouldn't say that um, this has necessarily uh, lead to um, bad research or bad results. There's a very interesting book uh, called Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble, and she uh, goes into much detail about uh, the results, especially Google provides, when you search for, uh, for black people and especially for black females. Uh, so um, a, a prime example is um, searching for black girls. And you can try it out yourself. Google uh, adjusted the results in some way, but you still get a lot of um, results that are a certain interpretation um, of them. The problem though is still uh, that um, queries are chosen by the researchers and it's not rule-based or um, it's a problem with building uh, query sets. And um, most of the time uh, the popularity of the different queries is also not considered. And uh, furthermore, we uh, don't have any information on the uh, providers of the results. And um, in most cases, also the results ranking is not considered, which really is a problem because, um, as I showed you, it's, it's very important um, to get to the top of the results list. And it's a difference if you have, uh, say, the Holocaust um, site I showed you on position one or whether you have it on position 10, how bad it is at position 10. To make matters worse, um, search engine bias is only a part of um, 
what uh, Ricardo Besa Yates uh, calls the vicious cycle of bias on the web. He has a, had a very interesting article in the communications of the ACM last uh, year. And this is uh, a diagram I took from the article. What he basically says is that web data, data itself is biased because no, uh, not, um, not all people do contribute to the web. So it is biased. And then you have um, on uh, down left, you have uh, the algorithms uh, using this bias. You have the sampling problems, you have uh, problems in processing uh, the data. So you have an algorithmic bias, of which a ranking bias uh, may be one of them. And then you have uh, the users interacting with uh, the systems. So um, they get biased results. And if you look at people uh, producing information in this case, you can see, um, well, to, to, to the, the, the literature research or uh, whatever you want to call it, um, you use a search engine. You get the top results from the search engines, uh, which may be biased in some way. Then you write up your article, put it on the web. Maybe it uh, gets ranked well. Another uh, person uses this article to write their article and so on. So you have this vicious cycle. The question is, um, is it possible to break uh, this vicious cycle? And um, do we really want it, or um, should we keep things as they are? I argue that uh, the bias in organic results is just the tip of the iceberg. And I want to give you some examples for that. Um, uh, the first one being user's understanding of search advertisements, and the second one, uh, search engine provided self inferences. When we look at um, the snippets of organic results in advertisements, we see something like this one is an advertisement, one is an organic result. But they are basically the same. One is labeled as an advertisement. Otherwise, you wouldn't uh, be able to distinguish them. And the question we investigated in a uh, large study, which is uh, re representative for the German online population, was whether users do understand what advertisements are and whether uh, it would change their selection behavior uh, when they know or don't know. So here's just uh, a small slice from the study. This is a task we gave users. They had several of uh, these tasks. We asked them to mark all the advertisements on the search results page. And uh, what is marked in red here is, is the correct solution. But only 35% of German internet users are able to mark all these results correctly. 18% marked at least some organic results as ads, which means they looked into the list, and this is something uh, we also saw when we invited people uh, to do the same task and um, well, um, uh, observed them uh, doing it. Uh, they looked at the list and uh, looked for the providers. And when it's a commercial provider, they say it's not. So many people, and this we also had from the, from the survey that was um, combined with the study, many people say, well, uh, you can't buy um, yourself into Google's organic results but many also say it's not a problem at all. So um, still, uh, and this is uh, another interesting finding, I think, uh, around 90% um, of the users uh, we investigated saw themselves as competent when it comes to using search engines. A different task from uh, the same study uh, is where we divided uh, the users uh, randomly into two groups. And one was given the results page on the left, the other one uh, the results page to the right. They don't differ in any sense. It's the same results, except that on the right-hand side, the first results are labeled as ads. And what we wanted to find out is whether users who understand what advertisements are on the results page behave differently than those uh, that don't know the uh, distinction. And what we found is that users who don't know what ads are click on the first ad twice as often as users uh, who know. So the problem, uh, the larger problem in this regard is that Google makes 90% of its money, and they make very much money, 90% of the money they make is from advertisements. So they have an interest that users may not be aware what an advertisement is. This is not saying that ads couldn't be relevant. Ads can be relevant, and ads are given in response to a query. So it's rather um, 
from a second kind of information retrieval system or a second kind of uh, specialized search engines uh, on the same results page. So obviously, this should be uh, there should be a clearer distinction um, under German law. Um, you are required to label ads in a way that users can distinguish, but obviously in this way. So I'd like to talk a bit about uh, search engine provider self-interest. Um, you obviously have heard of uh, the Euro Euro European Commission's decision on Google's anti-competitive practices. So there are certain um, investigations. Some are uh, still ongoing. And uh, what you always read in the press, uh, the European Commission sentences Google to a fine of 2.4 billion euros. This was for um, preferring their own shopping results. Uh, then in uh, 2018, um, the then by then uh, record fine of 2.4 uh, billion got topped by Google again for um, bundling Android, uh, the Android um, mobile operating system with uh, search and applications. This was for 4.3 billion euros. This year, uh, Google was sentenced for 1.4 9 billion euros for um, uh, not giving uh, equal access to their advertisement system and so on and so on. It will be continued. We already see um, the next case is local search, um, so this will continue. While we always see uh, the big numbers and the big money that Google has to pay, what is more important, from my opinion, is that um, Google is forced to change the practices on the search results. I don't say they're doing it, doing it in a good way at the moment, but still, they at least have to think over their practices. And this is an example from uh, 2013. This is the Google Shopping case where Google handed in a proposal to the European Commission. And we did a study um, using their different proposals. So the idea here was uh, that Google wanted its uh, own shopping results, um, the red box on top, and then give some links to competitors, and then present the organic results. And what we can see from the clicks, again, this is uh, representative for, for Germany. We did the same in France, in Italy, and in Spain, basically the same results. Um, and you can see that the majority of the clicks, 41%, go to uh, Google shopping results, and you have 20% on the uh, competitors, and the rest goes to the organic results. So here's a question. This is the second proposal by Google. Can you spot a difference? There is one. Uh, it's a rather tiny one. I'll go back to the uh, last slide. Yeah, uh, the competitors are shaded here. And I want to wanted to show you what effect it has. This small change. These are the numbers for the gray shaded you still can see that around 42% of uh, the clicks go to Google's results. But now only 16% uh, compared to around 20% go to the competitors. And still 40%, around 30% go to uh, the organic results. So what I wanted to illustrate with this example, that search engines can, through very small changes on the results page, guide users attention and users clicks. So after describing uh, the problem, I want to go briefly into uh, the approaches of say, making search more fair. And I see three areas, which is firstly to regulate Google, secondly to empower the user, and thirdly to establish more alternative search engines. People who want to regulate Google, mainly law scholars, often argue that we just have to force Google to provide unbiased or neutral results. As we already saw in Olaf's talk, this may be impossible. I don't know what a neutral or um, an unbiased result set should be. The basis of all ranking is to be biased in a certain way. You want to have a bias towards, say, good quality pages or whatever you would like to see. But um, the approach just saying um, we want neutral results um, doesn't help any of it. The second approach, which is the European Commission's approach, is to force Google to fix obvious biases or anti-competitive behaviors. This is the Google Shopping 
uh, case and all the other cases they have investigated. The second uh, group of proposals is uh, to empower the users. The first one is to increase the transparency of indexing and ranking mechanisms. The idea lying behind it being uh, that if users better understand the processes of indexing and ranking, they can choose better from the results and all the biases uh, that they have, say, from the decisions will uh, fade away. I don't think that it will work. More generally, um, uh, approaches uh, call for users uh, for helping increase users' information literacy. And as we already heard, media and information literacy is very important. And um, the problem, though, may be that um, it may not be enough. Then there are approaches that say you should give users more choice when using a search engine. This relates to a question already um, asked whether um, you could uh, change the rankings. I would be happy just to, to have my results depersonalized if it was possible or delocalized. Um, so if you use Google uh, today, you will get personalized results, you will get localized results. You can't turn them off. You can't change the results sorting without um, applying some tricks. But um, uh, an idea uh, that came up and uh, which is actually implemented into uh, Bing's uh, search engine in the US is to let users see contrasting views on the topic in the search results, which uh, at first view may be a very good idea. On second thoughts, it may be problematic because taking the vaccines case, um, you may have uh, the different opinions and you might uh, regard them as um, equally important in the discussion, which they are not. Then um, there is the idea of letting users re-rank results, which may be a very good idea, I think, uh, that you can say, I want a ranking algorithm that favors uh, popular sites, I want one that favors other sites. There has been research from Yahoo Research um, who had a system running about 10 years ago where you had a slider which ranged from entertainment to research. And depending on the position of the slider, the results ranking changed and you got different results. And I think this is a great way uh, to give users more opportunities and uh, basically empower them. And last but not least, and I think uh, Tom Albi will be talking about this uh, in his talk in the afternoon, is uh, that we should give users tools to explore the results, to go beyond just uh, a few results, and to analyze uh, what is in the research, in the results um, sets, so uh, that you can see uh, there may be people saying the Earth is flat, but it's a, a, a minority, and uh, the major positions are otherwise. Last but not least, um, uh, an approach is to establish more or uh, alternative uh, search engines. We will be hearing more about this in Astrid Marga's talk uh, this afternoon. Uh, and there are two, uh, I would say, uh, competing approaches. Uh, one uh, argument for establishing a search engine or search engines that do not follow commercial approaches. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a proposal to establish a search engine as a public service by uh, the public um, broadcasting um, institutions. And there's the more general um, claim to establish more alternative search engines. On the other hand, um, there are um, uh, approaches to establish the prerequisites uh, that allow more players to enter the search engine market and thereby increase the number of search engines with the approach saying um, every search engine is biased. But if we had more search engines and people would use more search engines, then the bias would not be so uh, bad. So there's an uh, approach from a, a law scholar who says uh, we should force Google to open its index to its competitors. And uh, he also argues that under European law, this is possible, which I was quite surprised uh, to read. And then uh, there's uh, an approach which, which I'm lobbying for, which is establishing an open web index as an infrastructure, infrastructure where everybody can build their own services on top. So you would have an infrastructure, uh, the index, um, financed by the public and run by an, by an institution, and then you had all the companies um, building their services on top. So in conclusion, um, 
we have seen that search engine bias is a severe problem as search engines are major means of knowledge acquisition. Search engine bias, or as I um, uh, argued, uh, bias on the web more generally, is a complex problem where there probably is no one best solution solving everything. And we still lack valid empirical measures of search engine bias, and this relates um, to the question I asked Olaf for um, how to measure um, this new type of relevance. And to end on a positive note, I would argue we should start to focus more on solutions, even if they are only partitional, and not only focusing on describing. for this interesting talk. Um, any questions? Thanks. Well, uh, thank you much for a very interesting talk. I just uh, had the idea if it's possible to give, um, uh, to give uh, search engines an uh, um, uh, obvious bias. Uh, so for example, people uh, read newspapers and one knows if I read the Tuts, it's left. If I read the I don't know if uh, FAZ is uh, more conservative. And um, so maybe it's not possible to capture the problem of bias, and there will be always uh, biases in search engines. But if I know this is a leftist uh, search engine and I like it, perhaps I can um, reevaluate re uh, my, um, yeah, uh, my position to the search engine. There actually is a search engine where you can do uh, this kind of thing, which is Google News. So you can uh, state your preferred resources and say, um, I always read the Tuts and I want more results from them. You can even say, I, I'm more interested in politics than in economics, so I will get uh, preferably these results. But it only holds true for, um, for um, Google News. And that is the problem. I agree with you. If we had such an approach where we can bias the search engine ourselves in a certain direction, it would be nice. And we wouldn't need more search engines maybe for that. So, um, I mean, there are um, ideas to, to have a left-wing uh, search engine or something. I think it would not be uh, the best way to go. Uh, it would be the best way to go to make preferences explicit uh, in a general purpose search engine, and then you have your results um, well, biased towards a certain direction, but still um, having the opportunity to take that out. Okay, so I guess on the left side, we had a question for Kat. Google stated that uh, they have the, they are reflecting the content of the web as the search results. But I think uh, the bias and the bias is in our society too. This is the, a similar kind of bias. Is uh, as Baeza Yates said, is based on the human interaction. It's based on the interaction with the search engines or not. Do you think that we are? are kind of uh, influencing the search bias by, for example, I would never search if the Holocaust has happened. This is, this is, this is, the, it is a part, it's a part of persons that are searching for, for example, for female athlete with a, with a, with a, with a, with a certain, with a certain, with a certain ambition and intention to click on the hottest girls there. Yeah. And that's, that's the difference uh, and, and the interaction human and Google is considering, and that's what I know, Google is considering, in fact, the interaction of the users in a very, very high rank way. So, yeah, uh, the users are, if you want to uh, put it like this, a part of the problem. Um, so we all have our biases, and um, every click we make and every search, and, uh, search, search query we put in is uh, used for improving the search engine. Um, if you take the uh, female athlete example and um, use the German example, um, the first uh, result for um, Sportlerin in uh, Google Germany is a result uh, of the hottest athletes um, uh, from Bravo magazine, which is, I think, there you can see uh, what the problem might be. There may be a teenage girl having, not having searched for, for athletes uh, before. And this is the picture she gets about uh, female athletes. And 
talking about role models, I think it's not the best way to go. Uh, so um, it is not, I think, the teenage girl searching for the athletes uh, influencing what is shown in the results. It's the majority of users. And there may be a lot of users who are interested in bikini kit pictures of, of athletes. I agree. But the question is, should all um, users be forced to see the same uh, results in that way? Uh, because a majority decided uh, that this is uh, the most popular, which we don't know because we can't uh, follow what Google actually is doing with the user data. So further, uh, and this would be a completely different discussion, which um, I think is very important, is um, we have a strong user orientation in search. And maybe this paradigm, uh, it's time to, to quit this paradigm. Because we saw that uh, results improved over, I don't know, I think, uh, 10 to 15 years using the user approach. It got better and better and better. And then came all the problems that I'm describing here, all the problems with fake news and so on, which also is a result of the user orientation of search engines. Um, also referring to the female athlete example, um, did you also try out what results appear when you type in male athletes? Yes, the results are sometimes uh, different. It's also, uh, always easier to illustrate uh, the point using the female examples. You can do it um, also with um, people from different countries. And if you type in, um, uh, in German, if you type in Russe, uh, it's completely different from what you get when you type in Russian. Mm -hmm. um, you can probably guess what you will see. And um, yes, um, there are gender differences, and it is, I think it's a very interesting topic to get um, into in, in more detail. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I get you right that you're pleading for a depersonalization of, um, of the search engine results? No, I'm not. I'm, um, what I'm lobbying for is that uh, you give back control to the user so that um, you can say, I want a certain type of personalization or I don't want personalization at all. But still, I see the usefulness of personalization because it could lead to debiasing uh, certain results. It could um, part at least, uh, solve the problem of uh, every user getting the same results and these results are biased in a way as the majority thinks they should be. Yes, uh, that would also be one uh, my question with respect uh, to the perspective you gave us at the end, uh, Dirk. What is um, your overall picture in terms of um, well, information society, so to say, if you opt for more self-control and diversity with respect to information practice, uh, with respect to uh, search engines. Because I think one strong argument uh, that search engines or even companies like Google have in, uh, to back their position is that their model works in terms of massive and conformant use from reading of information. And that is an aspect which is, on the one hand, definitely uh, well, negative in the sense that it may um, bring users uh, or unconscious users more to, to certain uh, search results. But on the other hand, it's a kind of anthropological, um, I think, uh, basic truth in some way. So how, for instance, would you or could you support uh, those crowdsourced models in terms of a more diverse uh, search engine environment where on, apart from single users searching from their very individual single point of view according to their preferences this may well aggravate to a um, yeah, community like uh, model for search engine or information vision of that, apart from the basic setting you gave us with respect to open uh, web interface as well. I'm actually not sure if I get, uh, got the question uh, right. Um, 
so you're asking for a vision that goes uh, beyond the individual user and considers uh, communities. Do you mean communities are building the search engines or communities of users using different uh, search engines? First of all, I didn't argue for unbiased uh, or less biased uh, search engines. Um, what I argue for is uh, that we have to go back to a variety of search engines, which may be uh, biased in very different ways. But say, uh, if the vision was that we um, stop always using the same search engine for the same purposes, and we will, would be um, better aware of uh, specialized search engines um, for certain fields or certain certain topics or whatever, um, then we would have um, the opportunity um, to use, to, to de-bias in the sense that the variety uh, helps us re get a certain bias from the one search engine and a bias from the other search engine. So I hope it would uh, even out uh, in the end. So then I would take our last question now here and then all other questions during the lunch? Absolutely. Okay. You talked about personalization and so on. I think Google is using a kind of canonical model, a kind of canonical user model for the average user. And you have, and everyone has a personalized model too. If you log, if you log in or if you have an IP address and so on, and uh, you get some kind of um, information. So you can go one step further and say that I'm create such kind of personalization if uh, I'm trying to find out during the interaction with the system if it's a six years old girl or a man or the elderly man or whatever yep. with, with such a kind of, of, of a premarital age and preferences and so on. And this would be something that would go, it's, it's not uh, really I mean, technically, it's absolutely possible, but it is not uh, to conform with our laws, at least in Germany and in Europe. Right? So it is uh, would be. It's already done because um, when you look, look at your Google profile, um, you can fill out actually whether you're a man or a woman, yeah, and, uh, yeah, whether how old totally you are, and so on. And if you don't do it, they'll do it for you. Uh, they um, assign to you a certain uh, age age range, and they will guess. Um, well, um, um, how old you are, um, uh, what uh, gender you are, um, actually uh, even uh, where you work from. Uh, yeah, I saw it, and I was totally shocked. Yeah, absolutely. Because they were so right about yeah. everything. Uh, they say, no, about I was 55, age. I don't like this. <laughs> even though, but, but, but if they would use that for personalization, yeah. uh, that would be a far more better... Well, uh, well, they do. There are different models. Um, there's uh, the classic personalization, there's contextualization, there's um, uh, user modeling in the sense that you describe, and everything is put together. And, um, well, uh, that's basically the um, extent behind the ranking in this engine. It's not a simple personalization as we um, have in the textbooks that we say, um, I do it only for on past query behavior. Um, I uh, model the search results for a certain user. The other things go in as well. Okay, so considering our time schedule, I have to close this very interesting discussion. Thank you again, Professor Dirk Lewandowski. And I think I have to make uh, the lunch allowance.